When will Canada's housing market crash? Or will it never crash and is it already heating back up? These are two questions I got asked a lot, and in this video, I'm finally going to answer them for you. Kind of. That's right, it's time for another Friday update on Canadian housing and the economy with your old pal Millennial Moron. I've got four topics for you this week, including some new data on housing prices and inflation that get very interesting when you look at them in a historical context. In this video, I'm going to get deeper into what I think are some of the bigger issues underlying these problems, so if you want to know the kinds of things that I worry about, stay tuned until the end. Also, I'm aware that it's Saturday today, but this week I decided to sleep instead of staying up super late to finish the video on a Thursday night. So, what I need you to do is get into character, like I do for you every week, and just pretend that it's Friday, alright? First up, the slowing real estate market has led to a significant exodus of real estate workers in Ontario, according to StatCan's Labour Force survey. The amount of people employed as realtors, brokers, property management, leasing, and office staff dropped from about 190,000 to 145,000 in just one year, almost a quarter of the entire industry. A major factor in this is that Toronto just saw the slowest year for real estate sales in 23 years. The last time sales were this low was when the city had a much smaller population back at the turn of the century in the year 2000. That's right, fellow millennials, the year 2000 is now far enough away that we can start saying stuff like turn of the century instead of the millennium. So enjoy that. Now, this is a big problem for the industry because during the boom, a lot of people jumped in to try to get a piece of the action, and in the Greater Toronto Area, the number of realtors surged to 73,000. But, unfortunately for them, there were only 65,000 home sales in 2023. With one buyer and seller in each transaction, that's 130,000 ends to the deals, which means that on average, each realtor was doing less than two deals per year. But, of course, the market includes higher-performing realtors who were doing a lot of deals per year and low performers who did none. This was a problem for clients as well, particularly buyers, because it meant that the person representing you in an extremely significant financial decision might not have done a deal in over a year and could be totally out of touch with the market and the process. Overall, between low sales and declining prices, Ontario realtors and brokers lost about 40% of their revenue from the peak, putting a lot of pressure on staffing levels and flushing out a lot of the inexperienced realtors who weren't doing any sales anyway. Even with the decline in employees, Toronto realtor and friend of the channel Dan Foch thinks that the market may still be too crowded. Personally, I think this could be a healthy reset for the industry, getting back to a smaller number of people doing a steady number of sales instead of a bunch of people hoping to make a quick buck from one or two sales. Next, StatCan released their inflation numbers for January, and it's actually not bad this time! Overall inflation slowed to 2.9%, significantly lower than the market's expectation of 3.3%. More importantly, the Bank of Canada's core measures of inflation, CPI trim and CPI median, also dropped to 3.4 and 3.3% respectively. In previous videos, I've talked about how I don't care that much about the overall headline inflation number, but seeing core inflation go down as well is actually a good sign. Now, while the decline was mostly a result of dropping prices for essentials like gasoline and air travel, there's still a handful of luxury items that are well above target, like food or living indoors. So it remains to be seen how the Bank of Canada reacts to this information, but at least for now, I think we can be cautiously optimistic about this news. Of course, the news media is already talking about how this one month of data is great news and rate cuts will be coming any day now, but the market's reaction doesn't reflect the same amount of enthusiasm, at least from what I can see. The five-year bond yield did drop after the inflation announcement, but it's still well above where it was at the new year, indicating that the market is a little more cautious about their expectations for rate cuts. Similarly, the BAX market is still looking at rates to drop about 75 to 100 basis points by the end of the year, compared to high confidence in 150 points in cuts just five weeks ago. If I had to take a guess, I'd say the Bank of Canada is probably going to hold the interest rates steady at the next meeting in March, but at the next meeting in April, when we've got another month of data, and which is also the release of the next monetary policy report, we'll have a better idea of their outlook for the year ahead. I'd also anticipate that the monetary policy report will include more good news in the form of a projection that inflation would be back to the target in about six quarters, just as they've been predicting for the last 10 or 11 quarters. Next, the Canadian Real Estate Association released their stats for the Canadian housing market in January last week. Similar to the regional real estate boards, the release focused mainly on sales numbers, which were up 22% year-over-year, while downplaying the home price index, which continued to slide downward for the seventh month in a row. The benchmark home price was down 1.4% month-over-month. The Real Estate Association notes that prices were still up 0.4% year-over-year, but of course, as we just discussed, inflation for the past year was 2.9%, so that still represents a decline in real value. Again, as usual, the news media is taking their cues from realtors, and CTV published this headline saying that the market is starting to turn a corner, and asked the rhetorical question, are prices rising? This headline, like almost every other one, falls under the umbrella of Betteridge's Law of Headlines, which states that any headline ending in a question mark can be answered by the word no. Incidentally, this also applies to the title of this video, although I did that on purpose as a self-referential joke, so take that with a grain of salt. So, finally we come to the question we asked at the very beginning of this video, which is, when is real estate going to crash? And based on this data from the CREA and StatCan, it's starting to look like the answer could be about two years ago. I know that just from me saying that, the real estate bulls on Reddit and Twitter are practically breaking their keyboards in half typing out their furious responses, but stay with me here. 
Based on data from the St. Louis Fed, in the 1990s real estate crash in Canada, which was considered a devastating bubble burst, real prices dropped by 21.1% from the peak to the bottom over a period of about nine and a half years. Now, keeping in mind that the methodology could be slightly different, using the latest data from the Home Price Index from the CREA and the Consumer Price Index from StatCan, real prices are currently down 22.2% over the past 22 months since the peak in March of 2022. I know that's a lot of twos, so go listen to it again if you need to. In other words, compared to the 1990s crash, prices have already fallen just as far, if not farther, except it's happened in about a fifth of the time. Also, despite persistent real estate industry optimism, I think there's still room for prices to fall further depending on what happens. Debt is a lot more expensive than it was a few years ago, and without that cheap debt, people don't have the income needed to support these sky-high real estate values. Based on the analysis I did in my cheap debt video comparing the relative borrowing power of a fixed payment compared to real estate prices, we're still way above any kind of sustainable price level unless interest rates drop significantly or wages increase quite a bit. Another factor that's going to impact things going forward is mortgage renewals. According to data from the Bank of Canada, the spread between existing and new five-year mortgages is about 260 basis points, or 2.6%. Unless we see cuts coming much faster than markets are anticipating, those people are still going to be renewing at higher rates, which is going to create more financial stress in the housing market, not less. Until these two lines touch, we really won't know what the mortgage market is looking like, which means we don't really know how home prices are going to react. Keep in mind, this rate for existing lending is an average, so it includes people who have already renewed in the last year or two, which is why the average rate for existing lending has already increased from the bottom. That means that there's a lot of people in this group who bought in 2021 when rates were at their lowest and prices were at their highest, so they could see their interest rate more than doubling on a huge amount of debt. Even if they're still able to cover the payments, that's still a tremendous amount of money that's going to be drained from their household over the coming years. Now, obviously people are going to try to tell me that comparing to the peak isn't fair and that this is just the froth from the past few years blowing off and that housing still goes up in the long term. But here's the thing about real estate crashes. They don't magically make housing affordable again because the amount of housing and the amount of people doesn't change. It's just a matter of what happens with money and debt. In our last major real estate crash in the 1990s, real prices only went down to where they were 15 months before the peak. But that meant over a decade of price stagnation for people who were depending on price gains, and prices didn't recover to the previous peak for almost 15 years. A real estate crash really isn't about housing losing value over the long term, it's about the people who took on a risky amount of debt in the panic to buy in getting crushed by falling values and rising debt payments. In Canada, a decline of just over 20% more or less forced people to sell their entire financial future to the bank to keep making payments on a falling asset. In the US, a decline of 35% was enough to tear down the entire world economy. Keep in mind that in Canada, real estate makes up a much larger portion of the economy than it did in the US at the peak of their bubble, so even a smaller decline could be just as devastating for us. The difference is, we're not big enough to take anyone else down with us, and that our mortgage system has a lot more safeguards and insurance measures to protect the banks, so we're likely going to see this dragged out over a much longer period rather than a rapid collapse like they saw in the US. Unfortunately for Canadians and the economy, real estate, rental, and leasing has become our largest industry, bigger than manufacturing by a significant margin, and that's before accounting for residential construction. In fact, real estate is larger than construction, mining, and utilities combined, so a downturn in real estate activity could have major consequences for the overall economy because we've collectively decided to bet so much on it. As I alluded to earlier, something that's going to be very important to watch is the trend in nominal prices versus real prices. The nominal price is what a house costs in today's dollars, the real price is what it costs when you adjust for inflation. I think that a general lack of understanding of the difference between those two things could be really important in market sentiment in the coming years. If people see prices staying flat or going up very slightly, they're going to believe that they're at least breaking even or even making money on their house. However, it's the inflation adjusted number that really matters because that tells you what the actual value of your home is. If you look at the nominal price numbers from the 1990s, it looks like prices are flat or even rising slightly, but when you account for inflation, the values were actually dropping. However, if the average person buys a place for half a million and then sells it for half a million a decade later, they can still justify it in their minds as breaking even. Because of that, I think we could see prices stagnating or growing very slowly for a while as the actual value gets eroded by inflation until we hit a balance where more sellers and buyers can agree on a price point. So you might be saying, okay millennial moron, who cares? We might see a 20 or 30% drop in prices, but they'll go back up and we still won't have a chance to buy in, so what difference does it make to us? Here's the thing, and this may surprise you given the nature of my content, but I actually stopped caring about home prices years ago. I don't even think they're the main issue anymore. Ten years ago when I was worried about home prices, most people thought it was normal and not a problem. Now that we've finally gotten to the point where everyone is worried about home prices, I think the problem has gotten much bigger than that. This is basically how I see it. Yes, we have been in a housing price bubble, but that whole thing rests on top of a gigantic debt bubble which pervades all areas of the economy. We've seen a tremendous increase in the amount of household debt over the past few decades, with Canadian households now carrying an average debt of more than 180% of their disposable income. With interest rates going lower and lower, people can afford to borrow more and more for the same monthly payment, so of course they're willing to bid the prices of houses up and up because it seems like they weren't spending any more money. 
Unfortunately, that debt number does have real meaning, and it's suddenly become a lot more expensive to carry it. It's been known for years that a major contributor to the Canadian economy during this time has been what's called the wealth effect, which is where households are more willing to spend money because of higher home values, giving them increased access to credit as well as a perception that they have a lot more money than they did before. As interest rates dropped and house prices went up, people who already owned had a lot more wealth on paper from unrealized capital gains on their houses. This led to a massive expansion in home equity lines of credit, meaning that people were borrowing money against their paper wealth to spend on real things, with HELOC debt increasing from almost nothing in 1990 to over $200 billion in 2013. At that point, they started to decline after the government stopped insuring HELOCs through the CMHC. However, there's still about $167 billion in HELOC debt out there, on top of about $2.15 trillion in mortgage debt. With people so focused on home values and dedicating as much of their monthly income as they were allowed to a mortgage payment, many households have also stopped saving enough for retirement, with 24% of households saying they expect their home equity to be their primary source of retirement income, and another 17% saying they didn't know if it would be their main source of income. In another broad measure of how consumer behavior changed, we saw household savings rates drop from historically normal levels of over 10% during the 1990s to rates around 5% or less over the past 25 years, bottoming out at just below 0% in 2018. So, what we're starting to see now is the scenario that I've been worried about, which is, after all these years of building up debt, inflating asset values, spending money against those inflated asset values, and barely saving anything, what happens to us when interest rates go back up? Prices have dropped, debt has gotten more expensive to carry, and regulations have changed to reduce the amount you can borrow against your home value on a HELOC to prevent home loans from going underwater if prices drop further. In other words, people have far less access to free money than they had before, and people who already have debt are seeing their disposable income being vacuumed up by interest. And now, we're starting to see the effects of what economists call the inverse wealth effect. I'll leave it up to you to figure out what you think the inverse of wealth is. Basically, consumer confidence is down, people feel less wealthy, and are less likely to spend. However, this is also happening at the same time that the cost of living has been increasing rapidly, so there's a twofold effect. People have less money to spend overall, and they also have to spend more on the necessities, so the amount left over for other spending and savings is a lot smaller, if it's anything at all. In fact, according to a report by RBC, the latest data from the third quarter of 2023 indicates that the bottom 60% of Canadian households had negative savings, meaning they spent more than they earned. This is going to have a big impact on what kind of discretionary spending people feel they can engage in, which spreads out to all areas of the economy. Just as an example, despite menu prices being higher than they've ever been, the majority of restaurants in Canada are currently losing money, both because of rising costs as well as a downturn in the number and frequency of people dining out. This is obviously not just limited to restaurants. Overall, Canadian households are spending quite a bit more on essentials, while they scale back on things like retail and travel, and their household net worth is sliding because of home prices. So yes, while prices might not fall by extreme amounts like some people were hoping for, it's not the home prices that I'm worried about. It's that we've been binging on cheap debt for decades and the hangover is finally hitting. An increasing amount of our economy has been powered by financialization and debt rather than actual productivity, and now that we can't borrow money for next to nothing anymore, we've got nothing left in the tank to keep the economy going. Every dollar that gets put towards interest on our debts is a dollar that households can't spend back into local businesses, it can't be used to start a new business, it can't be saved for kids' educations, or anything else that households might want to do with it. So, even if people hang on to their houses and avoid defaulting, that doesn't mean everything is fine. They'll be paying way more than they anticipated to stay in their home, which means they won't be building any equity elsewhere, including money for important things like retirement. It took us decades to get ourselves into this mess, and if this is, in fact, the end of the era of free money, the echoes of this debt trap may be felt for decades to come, just like the effects of the 2008 crisis are still being felt today. And that is what I'm worried about. Anyway, that's all the news for this week, so if you somehow enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe and throw a like or a comment on the video, because it does help me out. Speaking of helping me out, I haven't done a supporter shoutout in a while, so I think it's time for one of those. If you do want to support what I'm trying to do here, other than the usual ways, the best thing you can do is get involved locally in your area with groups that are advocating for affordable housing or helping to get more housing built. It's nice for me to talk about it to people online, but we do need to actually get things done, and at a local level, a lot of the conversation around affordable housing tends to be controlled by people who are against any kind of change. One of the most powerful things you can do is just get the yes voice showing up to things like public consultations and public meetings, because right now, there's always a hugely disproportionate number of people who turn out against all the measures that would actually help to address the housing crisis. All you need to do is look up who's in support of affordable housing in your town and reach out to them, because they always need more people to help out in any way they can. That said, I want to give another special thanks to all the people supporting me on Patreon. Hannah, Jessica, Flavio, Emily Rose, Andrew, Elizabeth, Sarah, Martin, Tom, Sheldon, Sebastian, Mark, Joe, Cherie, Priya, Om Gastonade, Hadaifa, Kata, Joseph, Catherine, Tabitha, Busby, another guy named Mark, Evan, Bill, Dominic, Zenmore, Bruno, Jamie, Jordan, with two O's, whatever, Nikki, Megan, J27, Ash, Mike, Thomas, Kira, John, Cassandra, Alam, Jan, Sam, Kyle, Dominica, 
Mr. Rogers, and Princess Jessie. Another big thanks to anyone who's thrown a few bucks my way on buying me a coffee, everybody watching on YouTube who's helping me bring in a little bit of revenue for my content, and of course, everybody else who cares enough to watch these videos and learn a little bit more about what's going on with housing. Okay, that's really it this time, folks, so thanks for watching and enjoy your weekend. <laughs>